I want to introduce your first panel presenter will be Robbie Pritchard. Robbie is a distinguished professor at South Dakota State University. And uh, he will be talking a little bit about his types of the facilities that they've had at the Opportunities Farm. So, Robbie, it's all yours. Shall I just yell at people, good afternoon. On, on these housing systems, there, there's a lot of things that we think about. The cost to build them is what we end up talking about a lot. Today you've been listening to some things about cost of operations and maintenance. Of course, we care how much in the panel all gets quizzed on cattle production rates. We worry about how much the cattle have comfort and well-being and our environmental footprint gets bigger all of the time. So, or at least the issues of it do. So, when the Opportunities Farm wanted to build a feedlot, like often is the case, we didn't have a feedlot extension specialist on staff, so they came and asked me what kind of feedlot they should build. And since I'm not an extension, I was allowed to go, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I didn't know what we ought to do. So, being a researcher, I pitched a notion back at them and, and they bit. And, and what we did, and, and the Ops Farm is just south of Lenox, not too far from here. Um, we took an approach where we built three different kinds of feedlot designs on one site. They're all 80 head pens. There's four pens in each of the designs. And, and in these we have open pens. Um, what it says open with shelter in the in the paper I wrote, I call it the Iowa system. I grew up on the other side of the Mississippi River in Illinois, close enough to the river that we had Iowa systems. And when I drive home, I go by all these Iowa systems. And and I learned a long time ago, you see these old guys from Iowa doing something a lot, you probably better take notes because most of them have their farm paid for. <laughs> and, and we put in a monoslope, and at the time we were figuring this out, the 90 foot deep monoslopes were becoming the rage. I like calling feed, and I could not imagine in my world being able to call feed on two different sides of a pen in the morning. I'm too scatterbrained for that. So there had to be a simpler way, and I'd been to Howard Moglers and saw how they were managing bedding packs and outside pens. And then during a feedlot short course, somebody said, well, yeah, you can make them half as deep if you want. There's some in Iowa and that guy's happy. I don't know if it was the folks that were up here today, but I got that message somewhere from in Iowa. And so we designed a monoslope that was just half as wide and incorporated some different things. So in each of these systems, there's 80 feet of feed bunk in every pen. There's six foot of water tank in every pen. Each pen has their own water tank. On the open pens, mounds are six feet tall. So we're going from scratch, and it's important to keep in mind when we talk about the open pens in this system, we were starting from scratch, so we built what we would build for open pens. It isn't inheriting when, when Somebody a couple of generations ago was feeding 40 steers and we kept growing in this little flat black spot out behind the place. So this is a different kind of open pen. These mounds are six feet tall. There's two of them in each pen. The fence lines go over the top of the mounds. On the open with shelter, the mounds are only half as big. Spend all the money for a shed, don't spend money on the mounds was kind of what I was thinking when we did that. Um, three foot high mounds, double mounds again. In the, in the monoslope or the confined deal, those are 40 by 90 foot pens because the exit gate is in the outside fence line. Bunks are only on the south side. Um, but there's 80 feet of bunk and then another 10 feet for the gate. Um, but all of the other conditions are similar. We're at one location, one manager, one set of nutrition in the system. And if you look at all of it from the sky, it gives you an idea of the prox proximity of everything. This is the open with shelter. These are the open pens. These are the monoslope pens. Matt and his family live right over here. Matt Loy manages this and has ever since the beginning of the construction retention pond for, for the open pens. So that's what it looks like from the sky. Um, on the monoslope barn, um, 
the idea that that I got inspired by Howard by is the bedding pack goes on the back side and we do have some slope to the center. Matt can go through the length of the barn like was discussed earlier on the producer panel and scrape stuff from the center. With the slope from here with the bunk outside and down to a flat spot here and slope off the bedding pack, the moisture gravitates that direction. That's what the pens look like on the inside. Ta -da, ta -da. This is what the pens look like on the inside of the, the open with shelter. In the open with shelter, the feed bunk and the feed alley are under the roof. And then there's concrete, a little concrete out past the edge of the building, and then out onto to the dirt. And again, those pens have 215 square feet. The open pens have 275. This is what six foot mounds look like. Mounds are twice as big and the slopes way higher than Midwest Planning Service would say. But building from scratch and being able to take clay out of the retention pond that we dug, we had the materials and the time to build more slope into a system that would hold up. So, as we started using these facilities, Matt would get in a couple hundred head of cattle, and as he processed them, a lot of them to a pen in each one of the three systems. Did that with 28 turns of cattle. Um, that's, that's a lot of replications of the same cattle going into those pens. All of the cattle are closed out at the same time in this data set as well. And we have the performance that goes with it. No calf feds in, in this particular data set. Uh, all yearlings, or at least backgrounded cattle, initial weights 800, finish weights 13 weights. My bias was that open was the only way to go, but I knew those old guys in Iowa must know something. Um, get down to average daily gains. Uh, the open cattle do not grow as fast. They're not weighing as much as at the end. No differences in intake. And that meant a lot to me, that it was really important to tell on the monoslope. I needed to know if they would really eat as much as cattle in the open because my history with what I knew about slatted floor barns from the 80s was they don't eat. And, and I like cattle that eat. Feed conversions favor being, whoa, being in some kind of shelter down here. We're picking up a quarter of a pound of feed conversion. It's not near as much as, as one might expect, but remember these are pretty well designed open pens. So, but there is a, a change in feed conversion that, that goes with this system. Uh, ben Holland went back through and pulled the data out to look by quarter at what happens with feed conversion. And these are changes compared to the open pens. And we're pick, overall picking up between about three and a half to four percent improvement in feed conversion. The quarters up here are the quarters that the cattle are marketed. And on average in this database, they're about 150, just shy of 150 days on feed. So this isn't the quarter they started, this is the quarter they got sold. And cattle that are marketed January, February, March, there's a pretty big advantage to having shelter in the pens. That fades in the second quarter of the year, fades more in the third quarter of the year, and the open pens Cattle marketed in the fourth quarter do better in open pens than they do in either of the others. And then all of these average back together give us this response that we talked about. So there are performance advantages. The performance is only part of the system and folks have been talking about the things they do with their manure management, day-to-day -day management. What do all of those things cost? Let's get it down to some dollars and cents kinds of things. And so to do that, Matt did something way more organized than I could ever do in my life. He kept track of the time and equipment use in each of these facilities for three years. How many tractors, how many hours on the tractors, how many hours of his time. And, and then John Rosinski took those numbers, that data that Matt had put together, and, and he took the University of Illinois custom rates for equipment, the twelve and a half dollar labor, I'm pretty sure they may not pay Matt more than that because he works too many hours. <laughs> um, plug that number in for labor, um, 
and tried to figure out how those things worked. And, and Merzinski prorated that per thousand head per day. Now, we didn't do the feeding because the feeding is not the cost of feed facilities and delivering feeds. It's the same across all systems. So we didn't bother with, with that information. This is what's different about the systems. When we do that, we did know the original cost to build all of these facilities. And in this first line up here is the original construction costs corrected for inflation to 2010 figures. And I don't know if these show up out there, but this is the dollars per head of capacity that it costs to build each of the systems. And, and then if you depreciate it over 20 years, we have eight and a half cents per head per day in, in cost on the, the open, 11.7 cents, 10.5 cents, is, is the cost for the facility. That's not processing and feed facilities, that's just the cattle housing facility. And then when we plug in the other numbers, we have the equipment, the bedding, and they priced the bedding at $35 a bale and it's principally straw. Uh, the labor cost, and these figures all add up to a non-feed cost, variable cost, of 12 and a half cents per head per day just under 15 cents per head per day and 32.6 cents per head per day. And I hear all these people talking about charging 25 cents per head per day yardage. And I'm like, huh? Because <laughs> um, we remember, we only priced labor in at 12 and a half bucks. If you add the construction cost to the cost of these, these variable costs, we get this total differential cost it's the partial yardage for these facilities of 20.9, 26.6, and 43.1 cents per head per day. In this big jump, you see a big increase in the hours logged on equipment, the substantial increase in the bedding, a doubling of the labor cost, and, and so that's what it costs per head per day. But now, if I own the cattle and I own the barn, I want to know what it costs me per unit of production. That's different than just charging a yardage bill. So, oh, before I go to that, this is the bedding use that came out of that data set. Basically, on the monoslope running just under five pounds per head per day of bedding added to this system. And the other bed systems did get some bedding during inclement weather. So, that's that price that we had per head per day. If we turn around and do that, since there were differences in average daily gain, we do it per, per live weight gain. The fixed costs were costing $2.36 per 100 pounds of live weight gain the, for the open. Those non-variable, or non-feed variable costs were running three and a half cents, total just under six cents per head per day for the non-feed costs per 100 pounds of live weight gain. Increases to 7.3 on the open with shoulder and, and doubles when we go to the total confinement system. So that's the cost per unit of gain, but we also had a feed efficiency improvement. So if we turn around and we look at, at the feed efficiency, it becomes an important component. We had this improvement in feed efficiency. Now, if I take 100 pounds of live weight gain and, and in this example right here, um, the total cost for 100 pounds of live weight gain is $1.40 different. And to put on 100 pounds of gain takes 25 pounds less feed. $1.40 for the added cost of gain divided by the 25 pounds less feed comes out that the feed, if the feed only costs five and a half cents a pound, I'd be broke even. Does that make sense? So that's the way we ended it. So what we did was how much, there was some reference earlier to the improvement in feed conversion and how that pans out and how it's sensitive to, to diet costs and payback on the system. That's kind of what this goes to. And unfortunately, this number is kind of low, but what we ended up doing is with this data set with the 28 pens and the three years of operating costs, calculated where things needed to be. At, a do, at $122 a ton dry matter basis for your feed, you can afford to pay an extra $200 a head in construction cost 
to go from open to the open with shelter. You'll be able to pay off that added $220 worth of initial construction costs with the improvement in feed conversion starting with feed at 122. If you're last year when feed was $322 a ton, you're making wildly more money or losing wildly less money than if you had cattle in the open pens. But the cost of the bedding and management on on the confinement system in this scenario, that that break even on the feed was at $489 a ton. Now remember that facility did not cost more. Operating the facility did. That was where the cost comes from, is finding ways to get less costly on, on the bedding. And if, if we can find ways to do that, it would make a big difference in, in those. So, summary comments. Those Iowa feeders had it figured out a long time ago. Only thing is you need to cash up front to be able to build the better facility. Open designs can allow acceptable cattle performance. And, and, and with the design that we have here, I think you'd get along pretty well if, if, if opens what fits you. On the confined system, we have to find a way to either lower the cost of the bedding or that manure would have to be worth about $50 to $60 per head of capacity to get to the break-even of the partial system. And those were my numbers. And did I burn my time already? Oh, I figured that Beth would be here if I went long. <laughs> questions? No, don't yeah. don't throw anything. Uh, just <laughs> questions. There's one. Right. Yeah. yeah uh, your cost for bedding. Now, if you don't have bedding back out, there's nutrient value in there. Is that being accounted for? No, no. The on, the, on question. the the question was on the cost for bedding and whether nutrient value going back out is being accounted for. No. Um, what we have in this is is at thirty five dollars a bale. That's the the price of the material and getting it. Those things, the, the price of, that's the price of the bedding. The manure, we did not compare the manure from the three systems. That, that's a whole new deal. So at 50 to 60 dollars a head, manure value that would be needed out of the, the bedded deep pack system, that, would, that was assuming zero manure value for the open pens. But that's one. That's another component. But I'm not a corn guy, so I let somebody else analyze the manure and figure out what it's worth. I heard they use urea for fertilizer. That's about. <laughs> <laughs> then a couple of years ago, I couldn't buy any potassium, and that really made me mad. <laughs> Other questions? Way back over here. <coughs> The, the question was on, on cost, was a retention pond in there? And yes, a retention pond construction was included in the construction cost. Um, and, and by facility and, and that facility square foot contribution to it. So it was much higher for the open pens than for the partial with shelter and, and nominal for the confined building. Um, as far as I was trying to figure out if they had the pumping costs on the retention pond in the in the calculations, and I think not. I'm not sure, Matt. Do you know if if you would have given those numbers to John? Okay. And 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 the reason that skipped my mind is, oh, you, you already switched me out. I had a cheater slide. We have a retention pond in the feedlot facility at Brookings because we had to have total containment, and we've never pumped it because it doesn't rain enough. <laughs> and no, it's not because it has a leak in the bottom of it. <laughs> we were prepared if we had to do that, but we haven't had to. <laughs>